stuff. I'm like, all right, well, if you really want to conserve something, you might have to make sure yeah. the religion's being conserved. Yeah, right on. Yeah, we're screening All right, I'm going to do a soft open, and then I'll mm -hmm. turn on introduce you, okay? Yep. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are rolling into another episode of the Candace Owens Show. I was on a walk recently through Washington, D.C. I was checking out the monuments, beautiful, beautiful city. Um, and I was surprised, uh, shocked actually, and a little bit dismayed to see um, that in nearly every church that I had passed, uh, there was a some political statement. There was a large LGBT flag um, painted that said, uh, love is love. There was a large uh, Black Lives Matter sticker on another church. And I was wondering, when did churches uh, become uh, so political, especially when uh, the issues they seem to be pushing and promoting seem antithetical uh, to the Bible, which they preach? When did all of this come about? And uh, is this a good thing? What does it mean when we talk about separation of church and state? Here to discuss all of this with me is Pastor Jack Hibbs. He is the author of Turn Around at Home. Pastor Hibbs, welcome to the Candace Owen Show. Thank you, Candace. It's great to be here. It's, it's, this is a topic that really, really yeah. frustrates me, especially um, as somebody who is conservative and somebody who was raised Christian. When I see um, churches really taking, I guess, taking stances that seem to me to be antithetical to everything um, that they preach. I don't really understand how it's happened, how it got this mm -hmm. um, got this bad. I don't ever remember seeing any sort of messages Correct. on churches at all. Right. Um, so where does it start? Let's first just talk about the separation between church and state. What does that mean? Well, first of all, going back to the original uh, statement where we get that from, this comes out of a personal private letter that was written to Thomas Jefferson, who had then just become president. And he had a very good friend in Danbury, Connecticut, who was a pastor of the church there. And that pastor had written that letter to Thomas Jefferson saying, now that you're in power, remember from where we came from, the motherland, the mother country, England, uh, there must always be uh, that protection of our ability to worship freely. And Jefferson's the one who said, I promise you there'll be a separation of church and state. And the content, context, was one of the government will never get involved in what the church's mission is. And if somebody right now who's watching this program and are listening thinks I'm making it up, all you have to do is look at the First Amendment. The First Amendment makes that crystal clear. The government was never to dictate or to initiate a state-run church while at the same time not inhibiting the worship of God or the gathering of those around a spiritual uh, topic. And so, so this was meant to protect the church. It was not only meant to protect the church, yes, but our founders were so secure in their, in their frankly, creation of this nation that this is the only experiment in the history of man where the church is protected, but so is the atheism of someone. Isn't that a, isn't this an amazing place? You can be a Bible believing or you can be Hindu, you could be Muslim and you can be an atheist and all of us share in the exact same rights that had never been seen before. And our founders had that security. And you know this when you visit the Jefferson Memorial. You know, I had to laugh with, with what you're saying because I think I walked past those same churches. <laughs> I saw those same things, right. you know. And so the founders, they were so comfortable in their own skin and in their own faith. And some of them even being deist, they understood, hey, you know what? Um, we're going to conduct ourselves based upon what is obvious. And that is this thing called natural law. And natural law has always been for millennia a reference to providence, which is God. Right. And so we've gotten away from that. Maybe we can go further down on that path of discussion. But how did we get to the place where we are now where churches, I mean, let's be honest, uh, most churches like the ones that you and I saw in D.C., they don't affect their community one iota. In fact, they're only taking up space, in my opinion. Right. Or, or maybe they are affecting their community, but they're well, doing it in a different way. And they're, they're almost using yeah. the institution of the church to really just deliver political messages. Yeah, um, and, and that is kind of where I get, become fearful because 
Um, first and foremost, I'll say this is nothing new. Um, so this whole concept of believing that churches have not been pushing out political messages or they haven't been used uh, to promote political messages can get destroyed if you look at the history of abortion. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as someone who's very into black history, um, I know a lot about Margaret Sanger, who yes. is the, the founder of Planned Parenthood. And when, you know, during this time in the 1920s, which was the progressive era, there was this real, real tangible fear. All of the best writers were, were writing about this fear um, right. that they were going to lose the, the good white Nordic race um, to the sudden flow of immigration that was coming from Eastern Europe and, of course, to the black Americans who were now right. breeding. So there was this fear that we have to protect the purebreds. And they actually closed the borders. They, they stopped immigration for a while. And all these books said, how else are we going to do it? We need to make sure people are not breeding bad. Right. People are not breeding badly. So how are we going to do this? And Margaret Sanger comes around right. and we talk, start talking about abortion and exactly. eugenics. Um, and she, you know, she considered the black race to be unfit and to be beneath. That's right. um, but she said, oh, if I go out and say that, that's not going to work. And she she literally wrote in a letter um, uh, to Dr. Clarence Gamble that they didn't want it to get out. that They wanted to exterminate the black that's race. Right. But if they went through the churches because black people had such faith that's right. in their pastors and such belief in their pastors, if they could just get out the message and if any of them get out of control, the pastors will quiet them down. She literally wrote this. And, and today we have, let's fast forward to today, right. and it's one of the biggest platforms of the left, and you have black Americans that believe right. that abortion is there to protect our rights. Um, the church helped that. The church yeah. helped uh, perpetuate abortion, which is, again, That's antithetical right. to what you read in the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, just backing up just a bit, if my memory serves me correct, it was Adolf Hitler that even used her doctrine to justify uh, some of his actions against the Jewish people. Uh, that is correct. Candace, this is something I have to confess. I, I have the privilege, privilege of pastoring a very large church, very multiracial church, and I'm saddened by how many of those who attend, uh, black uh, attendees, do not know what you just said. They have no idea that Planned Parenthood had that agenda to exterminate uh, these, this nation uh, of, of black people, and it's an abomination. And yet, you said it right. The church, like in the time of World War II today, the church, the pulpit, has chosen to be silent, disengaged from topics that cause controversy. And yet, I would submit to you, and I know I think you and I are the same fiber, any topic that is controversial is probably a topic that is worthy of a life and death battle. That's why it's controversial. Mm -hmm. That's why we've got to defend or to resist, because it's such a cultural dynamic change agent to the world that we're in. So today we have churches that are all about size, all about being hip, cool, or acceptable, and by the way, Jesus warned about that very thing, that he said, watch out, if the world speaks well of you, then you're no friend of God. So what am I saying, that the pastor and the church should be hated in the community? Absolutely not. What I'm saying is that pastors need to get back to what biblical truth is and stop worrying about what's trending. If they're going to lose Facebook friends or likes, they need to be biblically accurate, and they need to really believe what it is that the Bible says, because in doing so, they can preach and teach and stand with passion. Here's what happens when you do that. The culture of your church will change. It's those people who go out every Wednesday night or Sunday to the world around them, and they affect the school board. They're the ones that wind up taking a good example to the police department or to the engineering department or wherever or the school, whatever it is. And so for us, for me, that's a that's a very passionate issue. I think that Jesus is still correct when he said we need to be salt and light and we need to be um, effective in our communities. We can do that in a winsome way, lovingly, but always truthfully. Right. And, and it's interesting because for me, I mean, I was raised deeply Christian. My my grandparents uh, raised me during my formative years and everything sort of centered around the Bible. And I would say their biggest fear um, was for us, which I ended up doing anyways, despite being raised the right way, um, was for us to become very secular. Yeah. Right. And and that was it, there were so many teachings about secularism and the harm of secularism and, and, and kind of adopting right. adapting yourself to fit in. Right. Which is exactly what I went on and did once I moved out of my, out of my grandparents house. Yeah. And then I went super liberal and then kind of 
of came back home, as I like to say it. Right. Um, but it, it's interesting to, to know that that was their perspective. And it's something that I, I think shaped me to be a really good individual in the end. You yeah. know, like the, as the Bible That's says, right. if you raise up a child in the way that they should be, right um, eventually they will come home. Um, and But now we have a situation where if you have the churches that are now taking the secular view, mm-hmm. right? What what is what is the per- what is the meaning behind the Bible, right? What is the meaning behind the Bible's teachings? If you're if you're going to say, you know what, I know the Bible says this, but I'm gonna I'm going to take a view that's actually has well, nothing to do with the Bible. Well, the Bible separate to the Bible. Yeah, the Bible may say this, and but I feel right. And so now we have a culture where my feelings, you know, trump what the Bible says, and worldview matters. Your worldview will dictate how you live and how you raise your kids and how you conduct yourself as a citizen. It's my strong belief, as it was in ancient uh, Christianity in the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire did not understand Christianity, and they said so. They thought that there was a plethora of gods, but they couldn't figure out. I don't know if very many people know this, but the term atheistic was used against the Christians in first century Roman Empire because the Christian claim to believe in one God. Right, because that was at that time that they were moving from a poly, polytheistic exactly. worldview to um, a monotheistic worldview. Exactly. So they couldn't figure that out. But what they did say, and you have one emperor after another saying, you know what, these Christians, uh, they're the best citizens to have. They pay their taxes, they love one another, and they even love those who hate them. They're great citizens to have around. I believe that that kind of witness today needs to be reestablished. You know, a lot of people talk about revival, you know, revival and revival. What are we talking about when we talk about revival? We're talking about getting back to doing the right thing. That's what revival means, is being revived to life that is in God to do the right thing. Right. And, yeah. and I think, and I think one of the more important things to to point out for people that are not aware of history, like you just brought up, and and the Roman Empire, and and the things that actually began the the beginning of Western civilization, moving away from a monotheistic worldview. Uh, the mono, uh, the, the, the I mean, the poly, polytheistic poly. worldview. The polytheistic worldview is what allowed people um to have no morals, right? It, it was it was exactly. slaughtering children for the rain god, right? That's it, right. It, it, killing one another because of this god, this god. There was no there was no meaning. There was no thought because you oh curse curse the this god it's is true. cursed to me um, because they believed in so many different gods. It was actually when Western civilization started, really, in, in, in that period of, of the Greco-Roman time, that they started to go, wait a second, if maybe there's just one, right? And that <laughs> developed morality, right? This is Absolutely. actually what developed morality. This is what developed purpose. This is what made people move away from the tribalism and, and that anger and, and the murder and the senselessness behind exactly. it all. Um, and people don't know that, 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 that um, incredible role that Christianity um, played in creating creating the civilization that we see today. People don't know that that is what makes the West the best. People don't like to admit that. This is the reason they don't want their kids to live in Iran. They don't. No one would say, I want my kids to grow up in China. They don't want to admit it, but they, they live here it. and love it. Right, and, and so you say to them, well, which what other country would you rather have your kids exactly. grow up in? And they always pick a Western country, mm-hmm. um, and that is due to Christianity. You are so 100% correct, and in fact, there's a chapter in the Bible that just goes right through what you just said. Paul the Apostle, he's waiting for his ministry team to show up. He's in Greece. He's in Athens. And he's got about a week and a half to kill. He's just tooling around, and he walks up uh, the Agora there uh, on Mars Hill. And he's looking at all of these gods that are represented in the Roman Empire. They lined the streets on pedestals. But the, the, the Greeks were very careful not to offend the gods. You just said it so right. Oh my gosh, you know, my crop failed. I must have upset some god. So what they did was they had a pedestal with no statue on it. And it said to the unknown god, in case they missed someone, they didn't want to offend some god. Paul, in his brilliance, looked around and said, wow, you people of Athens, I detect that you are very religious people. Do you see this one, this inscription to the unknown God? This is the God I want to talk to you about. He's the God that's God over all these other gods. And you know, you laugh and I'm laughing and we're smiling. The brilliance of that was Greece and Europe was never the same after that moment. It went from a polytheistic world to a monotheistic world and our Judeo-Christian values then launched out of Europe, which was really the foundation of our Pilgrim Fathers, Mm -hmm. they fled to this nation to reboot, to restart what was so virgin and and so original in their heart. 
And um, I discuss a lot of these things um, with people who disagree, and I love it. But the founding document of our United States, it's very easy to find out. It's the Mayflower Compact. It's only about, what, maybe two and a half paragraphs long. And it tells you right there that we have come to establish a culture based upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't say we're going to convert everybody and put them in a headlock and poke <laughs> their eyes out until they say yes. It was, these are the rules of law and the the cultural impact upon a people that works. Right. So even today, I had a great opportunity, Candace, to be uh, at President Trump's um, State of the Union address. Oh, that's wonderful. It was awesome. And you know, I don't know if people realize this, but first of all, behind the Speaker of the House, or in this case, the President, behind him and above him, over his head, it says, in God we trust. Directly opposite the podium from where the President is speaking, there is a inscription there, and it says, of a face, and it says, Moses. And then all of the lawgivers of human history are all facing towards Moses. Somebody thought that was important enough to put into our nation's sacred documents and locations. Right. That even at the top of the Washington Memorial, which you saw, that great spire, very few people know that every time the president comes in to land in that helicopter, they come right at that thing and pass over. And if you look down, Candace, it says, glory be to God at the four points of that pinnacle. That, that, that Washington, D.C. is replete with biblical references. Our nation was founded upon Judeo-Christian values. We've drifted from them. We There's, have. There seems to be somewhat of, I hope, a turning toward them again. We'll see. Well, what's what's paradoxical about it, and you're correct, is that it's modernity, it's 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 modern society is the reason that we've sort of drifted towards uh, away away from our Judeo-Christian beginnings, right? And people go, oh, well, mm -hmm. you know, this is where the cool hit modern society, so we're going away from it. But the truth is, as I was just saying earlier, you wouldn't have had this cool hip society and and this modern society if it hadn't been for the Judeo-Christian so uh, principles in the first place. And I say that to people because, you know, I get people all the time that say, you know, I'm not people that are not deeply religious. There's tons of conservatives. I, I'm not super religious. You know, right. when you start talking too much religion, uh, then I'm like, uh, and I'm like, listen, you don't have to be super religious, but you should, if you love this yeah. this country and you love Western civilization, you do need to understand uh, the fabric of it. You do need to understand the fibers of it. You do need to understand what, 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 what sowed Western civilization. And it starts just where you were talking about. It just starts right there in the Greco-Roman period and that move away and because what it did was it allowed for rational thought yes. right so if, if 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 you had a flood in the nile river literally they'd go oh the gods isis we didn't kill enough children you know whatever it is right. um this is why it's flooding but then when they started saying no there's just one it actually gave birth to all of those early philosophers the aristotles the plato's right. and they started going mm. Mm. but it floods at the same time right if, if, if it's not all these maybe if it's not just curse the gods Maybe there's a reason the Nile is flooding at the same time every year, yeah. and and that began. It, then then start people start. Oh well, how how can we curb that? And then this allowed them to start you know building the, the concept of freedom, and and which eventually led to probably the biggest contribution, um, the abolishment of slavery, oh, right? Absolutely. Because morality oh suddenly they realized you know you you had to be you, there. Were, morality mattered because it wasn't just all of these gods, and and they they were playing a role in things that were happening. So exactly and then true. It led to the, and then they said, this is we can't do this anymore. We can't do this anymore. William Wilberforce, I'm sure you know well, but his his argument, uh, his life commitment in Parliament in England was to abolish slavery in the empire uh, of England, of Great Britain. And I think he's, I'm, I may be off on the time, but I'll be close. Something like 30 years he fought uh, to abolish slavery. And just near his death, he was victorious. But that kind of movement, his argument, now, you can be an atheist all you want, you know? I was going to say, God bless you, but you don't believe in God. But if you're an atheist, <laughs> good luck. Here's the thing. It was it was the Judeo-Christian value of Wilberforce where he saw slavery as a scourge. That affected our founding fathers. Uh, you've got guys like Jefferson and Adams who—Jefferson had slaves, but he inherited the slaves— 
And he went against the crown, by the way, by, by pains of death it was issued, that if you teach a slave to read, you are an anathema to the kingdom. Jefferson not only had his slaves all reading and, ri reading and writing, but he had them read and, and uh, memorize the Bible. You've got John Adams who refused to own a slave. Right. You've got George Washington who had slaves, but William Billy Lee, George Washington's right-hand man, in fact, it is said throughout history, Wherever Washington was, Billy Lee was. You could never see the two apart. When Washington died, he gave half of his wealth to William Billy Lee. These are men who inherited a, 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 a virgin nation that was uh, entrenched in slavery. And you can't turn a big ship fast. But they, they went down a path that eventually, thank God, uh, abolished slavery. Right. And, and and you're correct. I mean, talking about Thomas Jefferson, if, if you visited Monticello. I love it. Many times. I, yeah, I, I visited there. I got married right around the corner from there in, in Charlottesville, Virginia. And um, and when you walk through and you and you walk through the houses that his slaves lived in, and you, first off, let's uh, we can't remember, forget, he, he was in love with the slave. Thomas yep. Jefferson, yep. Do, do, Thomas Jefferson had yep. black children. Yep. Um, and he went and he met her in France. I, I can't think of her name at the moment. He met, met this black woman in France and said, you know, um, I'm in love with you. Come back to America and live with me. And she said, why would I? I'm free here in France. Why would I go back? And he said, I promise you, if you come back, um, your your our children will be free after, I think he said 20 years. Um, and he did that. He made good on his promise. Yeah. And the slaves that lived in, in Monticello, when you walk around That's right. and you look at the rooms, it is a fact. Nobody disputes it. They lived better than than white, than white people that were laborers at the same exact time because of the poverty that they had. Well um, said. They're standard. They weren't free. Now, there's no, like, understand. I'm not saying anybody should not, you know, but the standard for living for the slaves at Monticello was higher than it was for, for the laborers that we're living up north. And it was definitely better than the standards of the common man of Europe. Right. 100%. Overwhelmingly so. 100%. And, and Remarkable. that's something that people don't like to talk that's about right. because it's, you know, it's true and it makes people uncomfortable. And because, you know, this, obviously we all agree yeah. the institution of slavery was abhorrent. Um, but the way that they try to trash the founding fathers and not understanding right. that they inherited slavery. Um, and, and to call Thomas Jefferson a racist is almost crazy because he that's was right. in love with a black woman and, and, and pleaded with her to come back and, and gave, and she had all of his children. Right. Um, and her, those children became free. And uh, it's one of those things that it's, it's so important to talk about it, slavery in the correct context because right. uh, at the same time that they hate our founding fathers, they will never want to acknowledge that it was the West that abolished the trade first. That's right. The first. Led the world. You know, the France uh, followed by uh, Britain, followed well, by America. And, you know, I don't know if we can go down this road or not, but you can go down any road you want. do people ever stop and ask, where was Europe and America getting the slaves from? Oh, I, I mean. Hello? I know. Have we looked into what was going on on the Barbary Coast I know. of North it, Africa? I, absolutely. That is exactly where it all came from, and I've, I've talked about this extensively. There, there, there's a lack of education when it comes to yeah. a uh, the, the extended role that Arabs played in the slave That's trade right. and have always played in the That's slave right. trade to and, this day. And, and to this day, and then there's also just the lefts, uh, the, the way that they want to look upon things in uh, through a, a weird, mm -hmm. a weird lens where they think that like we were all kings and queens in Africa, not that we were also <laughs> enslaved, yeah. and that we weren't sold literally for basic things. Basic things we were right. sold for for mirrors. Right. Oh, this is a cool mirror. Here, take twenty of our strongest men. And when you oh, gin mirrors, gin like I mean, basic things that, that they sold us into slavery for our own people. Think of the because I'm a Christian. I'm just going to put it this way, and maybe for some in your audience, it's not acceptable. But for me, as God says, man is created. He created man in His own image. To think about what you just said, that I'm, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a barrel of rum and a couple of pieces of silver uh, for that black woman or for that black man. So degrades and so degenerates that person's value that to me, it's like demonic thinking. Mm. I, it's, I don't see how a human can think about another human, no matter what their financial or their the color of their skin, or if for that matter, even their views. Well, that that is the natural way. Unbelievable. It's a natural way in which humanity trends when there isn't a sense of morality. Exactly. And correct. morality, as soon as morality is developed and understood, you you immediately move towards tribalism. Yeah. Um. And and so that that is that is the great miracle. That is exactly. the Greek miracle, right? That that yeah. was a part of the Greek miracle, Judeo-Christian values. Um. And and that's the thing that we have to be so grateful for. So we know mm -hmm. all of that. Right. And yet, when I'm walking down the street in Washington D.C., here yep. I look up, and it's mm -hmm. it's. 
let's go the opposite direction. Yeah. Right. Let's let's. And I'm I'm real big on it's I, I it's my life's passion to speak to pastors to to reverse this. I I go across the nation doing this. And what is it that I'm doing? I'm asking them to get back to really believe what their Bible says and let it rip. When I say let it rip, I mean go into that pulpit on fire, having prayed and studied. Um, don't get your sermon from some guy online. Uh, don't say, Lord, bless my scrambled eggs and the message today. I'm talking about get your heart on fire, know what you believe, and and preach it and teach it because it's true. We're flawed people. We're broken people. We need God's grace, his forgiveness. We need the love of Jesus. We need the cross and that empty tomb. Once that's settled, truth never changes. Truth is truth. And it's not that. I, I, I think it was Ronald Reagan that said, he, he kind of lovingly rebuked somebody who said, we need God on our side. And Reagan turned and said, we, don't, we need to get on God's side. That's the side that we need to be on. And so I just believe, Candace, that... It's not too late that if pastors of communities, just think for a moment, what if pastors in a community starting this Sunday began to preach and teach from the Bible, which I believe is always relevant, they're going to address issues, even though if it's about the cross or it's about Martha pouring the ointment on Jesus' feet, you can work that in to the fact that this is what's going on in our local schools, and this is how that applies today. If we say that, and I believe the Holy Spirit is saying that, we could we could see a change in our nation like this. And it is called revival. It happened in the first awakening mm -hmm. in America. The it happened awakening. in the second awakening. Right. And look, you and I geographically are not, we're not far from the Azusa Street revival that mm -hmm. broke out. Uh, in California, it made history. Uh, the Jesus movement, it started the hippies. You're way too young to know this, but the hippies were stoned, free sex everywhere, hate Ashbury was going on. Uh, and they woke up to the fact that, you know what, we're killing ourselves. And there were people just reading out of the Bible publicly in Huntington Beach and Costa Mesa, and kids sat down and listened to the Bible. And there was a cultural change that was 40 years ago. We need to get back to that. Right. I totally, I totally agree. And and I and, and the great irony that I see, and especially when I see something uh, like when they paste Black Lives Matter on there, right? Because we know that that um, that narrative is is fundamentally false. Not only is it fundamentally false, like this this idea that there uh, that pl white police officers are gunning down black people uh, just because they're black. We know, we not only know that it's fundamentally false, but we also know that perpetuating that narrative hurts black people, right? So this this whole uh, idea that you're helping black people, right, which is fundamentally false, because then black people right. go they're they're more nasty towards police officers and they're more likely to get into the scrabble. And it was uh, proven um, that that year when this narrative was was really at its peak right. um, in 2016, uh, it increased black homicide went up by 19 percent because police officers didn't want to go into neighborhoods for fear of being These, called racist that's right. and, I know it, that is a fact. and it's and it's horrible so it's like you you guys are actually uh harming harming you're, you're hurting people um by not being honest by by not saying you know this is the truth by not producing truth um and instead taking this easy secular yeah. path of seeing like hey we're hip we're cool this is trending right now so we're just going to go ahead and stick this bumper sticker um uh, on our churches it's, it's it's really really wrong and it's 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 completely irresponsible wow um you know, for me, I, I don't know. I'm just going to speak the truth, and I don't know how this lands. What you're saying, for me growing up in Southern California, um, I think I heard the word racism way later in life. My black friends and Puerto Rican friends, my Hispanic friends, the guys on my football team in junior high and high school, I never thought for a moment that they were Hispanic, black, or that I was Portuguese. It never once dawned on me. We were just living life. And then the topic was brought up somewhere along the line. Now, in my generation, I, I was able to escape that. It didn't, it wasn't thrust upon me. I woke up to it later. My point is this, that when Black, Live, black Lives Matter posters went up, the thought entered my mind. And again, this may be wrong, Candace, I'm confessing now, but it's honest. Why would someone say that? Because to me, that message says that other lives don't matter. That's how I took it. That's how I still take it. 
If I put up a sign that says white lives matter, I am sending a message that all other lives are lesser than my race. That is sick. Right. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. If somebody's put up a sign and said Puerto Rican lives matter, it's incumbent upon the human nature because once again, remember, we're creating the image of God. Your, I will lay down my life for your life because you have been created in the image of God. Yeah, but I'm Puerto Rican. I don't see that. I do not see that. And I believe that's, that is so played out beautifully in a weird theater, and that is war. When men are bonded together in, in war, they're, the color of the soldier next to you is gone. Right. You are fighting for a greater cause, and those petty divisions no longer exist. So I think you're causing me to think something right now, and here it comes. You shared that you were brought up in a Christian home, and that was embossed upon your heart. And when you strayed, you had something to come back to. Mm. Probably, you know what? When you, when we, when I, when we strayed, we were a little bit full of ourselves. Absolutely. We, we kind of knew everything. Leftism, narcissism, mm -hmm. it all goes hand in hand. Atheism. It, <laughs> all for me. What how, What will you give me in life? That's that correct. was your value. That was my value. Mm -hmm, of course, because we were living for ourselves. And then we realized that that doesn't work. And you, thank God, had roots to come back to. Could it be that what you just said about yourself, is that where America's at? We had roots and we knew those roots. Mm -hmm. Our little kids in public school, even the McGuffey Reader, they were raised in those schools with ABC, the alphabet, using the Bible. They had a foundation. If they were believers or not, they had a foundation. Then we got wealthy. Then we got successful. Then we became the greatest of everything on earth. And now we're kind of petulant. We whine about everything. We complain. Nothing fits. Nothing's right. Like Cinderella. It just doesn't work. Everything's wrong. Well, we're so self, you, yeah, narcissistic. narcissistic. We're so consumed on self that when we're like that, then we point around. The government's wrong. The police are wrong. They're wrong. This is wrong. Everybody's wrong but me. Right. I think as a nation, we're like a teenager, a spoiled, rotten little teenager. We are. And we need to get back. In fact, you know what? In some ways, we need to learn how to suffer. Suffering is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's, listen, my my grandparents, they immigrated from Portugal because they suffered. M on my dad's side, they were farmers. They worked hard. Uh, your family, they had their trials and tribulations. That builds character. Today we think, oh my goodness, my internet's down. We're gonna have a panic over this. No. We don't know the how to- The irony of you saying this. I just had this conversation with someone. I said, they, they don't know how to deal with small things. They've no. never had to deal with big things. No. And, no. and and so everybody puts themselves into a tissue. Literally, I use the example, like your internet's not working on, on your plane, on oh your first class gosh. flight, and you are ready to sue United this Airlines so because you think that you should have had, you know, ability to email That's... and Instagram the entire time you're on the plane. That's right. And that is a condition of our society because, it, and that only happens when a society is perfectly comfortable, perfectly peaceful, and has had no struggle can can this can this sort of ridiculous so spurt and 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 the harm That's here awesome. in, in talking about this when it comes to the church is that the church should have learned its lesson uh when the church starts 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 trending uh towards immorality right, right. Uh, uh, Bad things happen, right? I mean, let's talk about why there yeah. ever was a Catholic right. and and Protestant war, right? right. Why did Martin Luther right. uh, nail his ninety five theses? Right. Exactly. Because the church was coming around for indulgences, something where they could buy their way yeah. into heaven, mm -hmm. and, and people that were already poor, they were zapping something like six hundred thousand dollars from entire cities right. and giving it back to the church, right? And immorality, right, actually spawned something that then turned into bloody years yes. uh, between different factions of Christianity, right? right? So right now, I think. We're almost in the same in predicament in terms of for people that, that do turn to the church, when they know, right, that they're promoting immorality, that they're promoting things that are not right, which, by the way, to their own detriment, because you're, you're promoting the same side of people that will eat you first, right? The same people, the left, the same people that mock right. people that believe in Jesus Christ. That's right. Right. You're promoting their right. views on white versus black versus gay versus straight, you know, this right. ugliness and this division. Right. It's not going to end well. Well, to make your, listen, um, someone from our church told me this story, it's exactly to what you're saying. Uh, they invited a friend of theirs, I'm not gonna name the church, it's a local LA church, but they invited their friend to church. Their friend was not a believer, but they invited their friend to church and this, this person told me, I thought this would be a good place to take them. 
So they take them to church, and after the church experience, the unbeliever said, um, I, I don't see m- much of a difference of what we just did. I mean, the, the band was cool, <laughs> and the, the uh, lecture the guy gave, all right, whatever. Well, wait a minute, we're doing that person an injustice. Because the truth of the matter is, if we take them to church and they, they think that it's just a little bit different than the world, but not much. So, and the world does it better. Let's be honest. The world does better music. The world does better lighting. So why go? They're insulting. A lot of Christians are insulting the non-believer. Non-believers are not stupid. They're searching. They have that proverbial Jesus hold in their heart too. They're looking. That's why the guy said, I'll go. When they go into a church, they need to encounter truth. They're not dumb. They know if they can just sleep around and do whatever, well, that's what the world does. I can do it in church. Well, then what's the difference? But when they find out that God says, I've got a better life for you, completely better, and it's healthy, and you'll be incredibly satisfied. Look at what's going on around our world. Look at where we're at, where we live. I mean, we live in paradise here. And yet people are committing suicide because they're not satisfied. Do you think, do you think the fear, is, is there rather, is there a fear, is there some pastoral fear? Is there a reason they don't, that, that they're doing that? Like, or is, is somebody knock on the door and say, hey, can I put this uh, love is love, Black Lives Matter stuff? And they're like, sure, sure, because they don't want to be seen as someone who is not accepting or, or are they fearful that no one's going to show up? Yes, yes, and yes. They're, they're fearful of being rejected. Again, this all comes from not having a strong foundation. So they're fearful of criticism, fearful of rejection. You know, you know better than I do, or we know it together. Uh, if somebody wants to get at us, they'll just call us names. They'll try to, oh, you know, you're a homophobe, or you're a xenophobe, or you're. So all that stuff starts flying about. Pastor doesn't want to get involved in that. Then cowers back, doesn't want to talk about controversial issues. But you know, here's the big bomb. The 800-pound gorilla in the room is. Jesus said that all have sinned. The Bible tells us that we all need him. He says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but through him. That's a radical statement. And it, and, and, and it can stay radical. It can stay crazy even. When he says, if you kill me, don't worry about it, because in three days I'll be back. That's insane. Unless three days later, three days later he's back. So when he says, and the Bible says, that we all need him, we can take a big breath and realize, hey, you know what? Instead of us living in this hypocrisy, I love that fact that you started out talking earlier about hypocrisy. Let's just face the music. If you're pointing your fingers and judging this person, and if you're condemning that guy and this thing and the other, don't you see the strangeness of it? Who are you to do this? When God is the only one who's justified in saying, All of you have sinned and come short of the glory that I expect. That's why I sent my son. I will place your sin upon him and you will receive. I will transfer to your account his righteousness. That's called the gospel, Candace, and it's free, but it costs God everything. You say, why is that so important? Because when that happens, I cannot see any other human being less than myself. In fact, the Bible tells me to serve those that are around me. Right. And I mean, and, and if people don't understand this, you would expect that pastors would understand that Satan is the author of lies and deception. That's right. Satan is the author of lies and deception, right? So how can you be a pastor and stand on things that you know to be lies or things that you know to be deceptive, like 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 the Black Lives Matter craze? And, and I'll give you this example, by the way, which I thought was stunning. I saw a video trending on Facebook, and I think my dad tagged me in it. And um, I, I, I looked until again, it was a pastor, a black pastor. And it was incredible. He, he he's you can see he's he's getting up there giving giving his sermon, and um, suddenly he takes his glasses down. He says, "You need to get out of here, right?" And whoever's recording to catch this moment, you know, make uh-huh. this create this viral moment. He's like, "You you need to get out of here." And he's like, "Why do I have to leave?" And the pastor says to him, the black pastor says to him, he said, "What you do when you're outside of this church is not my business, but when you come into this church, you will be dressed as a man." So he was talking to a man that was dressed as a woman. You don't see him, right? I got it. 
and the entire congregation burst into applause and, and the person leaves. And I thought, wow, what conviction, right? Because he's not saying to this guy, this is you need to go do, do, you know, be this person, whoever you are, you want to be in the world, right? But when you have, you, you come through my door on Sundays, there will be no deception. Yeah. There will be no lies. There's only truth in this room and the Light. power of that. Absolutely. And it didn't trend, by the way, in a bad way. This guy, I mean, I don't know. I'm sure he got terrible emails, but in terms of the discussion that was happening, the person posted, like, what do you think of this? All of the comments from black people were 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 who were saying kudos to him. Absolutely. Kudos and, for him. And think about it. Change the narrative just a bit. We'll remove that narrative and insert um, it's a guy sleeping with his neighbor. Let's let's make that the scenario. And the pastor calls him out on that. Okay. Both are equally true and honest events. That pastor's defending truth and his flock. But what people, because emotions will just spike in a moment. Before they spike, we need to realize something. When I go to my doctor, my doctor, if he knows something about me that's not good, uh, he's going to tell me. He's not going to feign that he loves me by not telling me that I have a very funny looking spot on my arm or something. He's going to say, dude, we need to cut that thing out. That pastor spoke to that man in a way that that guy went home and knew, he knew that he had heard truth. Mm -hmm. And just maybe while the world panics and tweets and Twitters about all these things about what that pastor did, there is a, a young man rethinking his position and it could very well save his life. And, and you know what's interesting about it? And, and you saying that the manner in which he said it, it was not hateful. You could tell. Yeah, it was It was just truth. It was powerful and it commanded respect. Right on. And it was, here are your options, right? You can go out and be, be who you want to be in the secular world, right? But when you come That's here, awesome. it's truth. And, and I thought to myself, That's wow, it. imagine if every church yes. across America adopted that position right there, had the strength yes. to say, I don't know how this is going to play out on Facebook. I, I don't know if this is going to be too, I don't care what the world's going to make of this moment. Um, but I take, I take my role seriously. Right and, and if you want to be a part of this, you are going to commit to the fact that we are on the side of truth and the world can move around, right? But truth never moves. Truth, the, the truth, it never, ever converts into anything else than the truth. It's incontrovertible. That's awesome. Candace, yeah. you know, we're having church right now. Right. Can you realize that? It's a good thing my show comes out on Sundays. <laughs> there you go. Right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, it's, it's, and I hope that, you know, it, with people watching this, that they can understand. Um, like I always say to people, you do not be religious. You, my show is not about religion. Yeah, understood. Um, but do understand the role um, that religion has always played um, in, in your life, the, the freedoms that you enjoy. Um, yep. uh, you, you, we have Judeo-Christian values to thank for that, and that that's always a lesson that I want people uh, to take away when they're listening to my show yeah, is, is awesome. truth and freedom, um, and how do we protect both? Yeah. So we wrap every episode by allowing you, you're I, ready, you have I a script. I don't have a script, but yeah. I'm ready. <laughs> so wait. To leave a now, message, this is gonna be the, the camera. camera. Yeah. And uh, I've got two minutes. And you've got two minutes, and Dana's got the clock, and it's going to be a face message for the world. Don't look at her. You're going to get nervous. <laughs> no, maybe I should go like this. No, 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 no. It's okay. Okay. On your mark, okay. get set. World, I give you Pastor Jack Hibbs. Listen, the greatest thing that you can do is to speak truth. It doesn't matter if you are married or single, if you have kids or not. It doesn't matter what culture you've come from. You need to know truth. Truth today is the very commodity that is being uh, bartered with and attacked and played with on all levels. If it's politics, if it's business, whatever it is, truth is always the issue. And so what I want to stress to you is having a worldview, because all of us have a worldview, that you adopt the worldview of the Bible. The Bible. The, the longest living, awesome, culture changing, life changing word of God. And what happens is the more that we have the Bible truth in our lives, the less laws we need. Because you know what? I'm not going to murder. I'm not going to cheat on my wife. I am not going to uh, commit a crime because I've got the truth of God working in my heart. And you can have that too. The platform that God gives you is a platform that he offers at the expense of the life of his own son, Jesus Christ. And it's this message that transcends all religions on earth. Listen, I'm not encouraging you to adopt another religion. I'm asking you to receive Christ as 
a relationship, that God loves you, and there's not any lifestyle or sin that you could have ever committed that's greater than his blood to forgive. You can start life all over again. You know how we reboot our computers or restart our phones when they act up? Guess what? God wants you. He's giving you the opportunity to restart your life, and you can do that. There's hope. You don't need to trend like others are so many today who are losing hope, and they're putting a gun to their head, or they're taking the bottle of pills. You don't have to do that. He loves you. He wants to hear from you. And the Bible tells us that if you just call upon him, he'll hear you, turn to him. And so the greatest thing that I can say for America, where I live, our home, is that America would turn back. And that would mean that I would speak to the pastors. Pastors, turn your church congregation back to the Bible, back to truth, and be fearless in your pulpit. Be on fire. May God envelop you in his word and in prayer as you prepare. And then on Sunday morning, like George Whitfield in early America, atheists went out to hear him preach, including Ben Franklin, to hear him preach. And it was asked, why are atheists coming to hear Whitfield preach? We don't believe in what he's preaching. And they said, no, you know what? We don't. But we've come out to hear him because he believes in what he's preaching. And so that's my call to America to turn back to the Lord. And I think that there'll be great hope. So that's my message. And I have no idea how much time I have left.